Lights, camera, action. And today we have here Christine Vachon. Welcome to the podcast. Um, I uh, wanted to start off with finding out a little bit about the newest project that you've just gone into. Can you talk about a little bit about that, or is that something that you're not really talking about right well, now? Well, we, ha- we actually have five movies in post right, right but now. The, 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 that you're starting, that you're in production on, on the DuPont story. That's in well in post. That's well in post, yes. so that's all shot, okay. All shot, shot it over, uh, over the winter. Okay. In Cincinnati okay. and and around, and for once we got to shoot Cincinnati for Cincinnati because it takes place there, uh, or a lot of it does, um, and that's in post along with Todd Haynes's Velvet Underground documentary. Oh right, uh, a film by Janixa Bravo called Zola, a film by Josephine Decker called Shirley, uh, and a film called uh, The Sounds of Philadelphia by Jeremy Gez. Nice. So you've been uh, uh, putting together uh, uh, financing for your whole career, but these new films, are these all under labels like this one was Participant, I think, that you're working with for the DuPont story? Yes. And, yeah. Yes, we did that one with Participant, uh, and we did Janixa's movie with A24. Uh, Sh- Shirley, the Josephine Decker, will you know, will take it to a festival and sell it. Uh same with the Jeremy Gez. Um, so, you know, it's kind of... And, and Velvet Underground is for the Universal Music Group. Right. But but in, in a sense now, how has your producing career changed for financing in the current era versus what it was like early on? And did you have specific high net worth individuals that you would approach or or foreign sales, pre-sales? How would it work over the course of your career going back in time to current day? It's changed a lot, hasn't it? Well, it has and it hasn't. I mean, I think one of the sort of uh, stymieing things about the current state of feature film uh, financing is it hasn't changed that much, and it, and it, and it could. Uh, I mean, look, we do a lot of television. We're working with the streamers a lot, of course. We have a first look deal with Amazon. Um, But in terms of actual, you know, film financing, that old model of, um, you know, uh, foreign sales based financing still exists. And it's outdated and clumsy and very problematic but we're doing a movie that's going to shoot uh, in Romania in a few weeks, and it's that same model, you know, uh, foreign pre- sales pre- element, sales. Yeah, a yeah. bank, uh, you know, a, a gap financier, right. et cetera. Right, so that's still, that's still active for you yeah, guys. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, look, then sometimes we, you know, a movie like with Participant, they just, they, they are the studio, uh, as is Netflix, as is Amazon, you know, um, but uh, but we still are cobbling together these these budgets the same old way. Right, and for and I'd, I'm interested in your relationship over the years with John Wells because he's been sort of I, someone that I know less well. Can you mm-hmm. describe a little bit about what your relationship working with him has been? Well, our relationship with John, you know, he right after Boys Don't Cry came out, we were in a position to make a uh, fairly traditional uh, housekeeping, first look deal, et cetera. And we started negotiating with a number of companies um, to do exactly that. And then John Wells came into our lives and he was very interested in the work we did, but also wanted to make a less traditional deal with us that um, continued for a good 10 years. I mean, we are not officially in business with him anymore, but being in business with him for those 10 years, allowed Killer to become the force that I think we are now. It gave us, you know, obviously financial security, which, you know, was a big deal, to grow our business, and it allowed us to become insanely prolific. Um, So, you know, while we're not in business with him anymore, we do obviously have a very good relationship, and, uh, um, you know, it's really, as I say, thanks to him that we are where we are. Interesting. So take me back now. Let's go. Let's go way back. Back to to Brown University. Why? Because I'm interested. Okay. I have a specific interest, and you're going to think it's really strange, but 
you were in college or at the same time I was in the, oh, okay. in the early 80s. And there was a professor that I had there mm-hmm. whose name was Phil Rosen. And he went, and I don't know if he was at Brown, and I'm not sure if you studied film. I'm just curious if, if you ever collided with him. He was one of the early PhDs in film, uh, film theory and all of that kind of film history. I don't know if he was there then. Maybe he wasn't at Brown, uh, parallel to you, or came later. Uh, the name sounds kind of familiar, yeah. but, you know. But did you, going back to Brown, did you study film history, writing what was what what was the launch? Because you launched from there w- with Todd Haynes and Barry Ellsworth into what would become Apparatus, right? We all studied semiotics. You all studied semiotics. Okay, so that's where you guys all came from originally, right? I think both Barry and Todd were dual semiotics and art majors. I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but I think I'm right. Um, I was just straight on semiotics. And did you have? Uh, uh, visual arts interests as well while you're in school or because obviously ultimately you went into moving images and working could, with motion the, picture. The rule there at the time was you weren't allowed to take any actual physical production classes until you'd taken you know, uh, quite a few theory and semiotics courses first. Right. So most of the people who were in the one film production class that there was uh, were you know were seniors or or you know slightly advanced juniors. So, um, so I did manage to take that class my senior year. And was there any crossover with RISD because you were in the same town or not? None of that. I mean, so not it in, all sort of it launched from Brown. Yeah, not in that class. I mean, I can't imagine if you were at RISD why you'd go take the one pathetic class so, at Brown. Yes, exactly. you probably had. If anything, it probably went the other way. Um, and also, if you came into that film class, you'd find, you know, students who were so paralyzed by semiotic theory at that point that they, you know, could barely put an image onto celluloid. So, you know, it wasn't the most fun atmosphere. It was a lot of people, you know, trying to make things as anti-narrative as possible, which doesn't make for a lot of, you know, entertainment. Of course, yeah. So now let's get into, so you and, and, and Todd and Barry were all students of semiotics, and this launched you then into your, what would become your career in working in film. Can you, or how did, how did, the, how did the steps take place coming out of Brown and all of that? I mean, it was a different time, and I think that, you Early know, 80s. we all came to, you know, we came to New York. Barry and I were from there originally. Todd wasn't. Um, and... Uh, it was, you know, a time of, you know, the uh, there was a real collision of art and music and film and fashion. Um, a lot of filmmakers were making their first movies, like Jim Jarmusch and Spike Lee and Betty Gordon. Uh, there wasn't a real industry here at that time. In the early uh, 80s, right. In the early 80s. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there was the occasional movie that would blow through town because they needed some exteriors or something. Um But there was, you know, the first movie I worked on was a film called Parting Glances, uh, which, you know, Bill Sherwood directed. It was Steve Buscemi's first film, first appearance in a a feature film. Um, And that movie was made in a kind of stop and start, raise a little money, shoot a little, edit a little, raise some more money, shoot a little more, et cetera. Uh, And... um, and it was very ins- what was very inspiring to me about that film was uh, was it was a very personal story, obviously, but it also it also required um, production. And uh, up until then, I really thought there was a vast divide between, you know, Hollywood cinema and experimental cinema, and nothing in between. And seeing what Bill was doing, which was, you know, basically using the narrative tropes of Hollywood films to tell a very personal story was, it sounds obvious, but it was really felt very revolutionary at the time. Right, right. And, and this whole process of, of, of getting engaged in, the, in, the, in film production, producing ultimately, was a, was a, a work in progress for you. You, you started... And working on sets and right. PAing and all that. Can you right. talk a little bit about that era and what that was like? And it was like through '87 before you started 
uh, uh, working as a sort of a quasi company with apparatus films, right? right? So you, you had you know four years, I guess, of of doing different things, right? Well, I mean, I started out earning my living as a proofreader, which was a very lucrative that. thing to do at the time, and offered a lot of freedom. I mean, those were the bad old days of like, you know, as a freelancer, your paycheck was made out to cash. And, you know, it was uh, um, it was kind of the Wild West. Yeah. It was great. Um, and uh, I started working on film sets. Um, first, I started in the edit room. I mean, I was I sunk dailies uh, for for parting glances. This I did not know. And, I love this. Um, and I would go from my proofreading job. And they often shot nights on parting glances. So I would go from my proofreading job and I had keys to Bill's apartment so I'd get to his apartment at like 10 or 11 o'clock at night, sink dailies for three or four hours. Then he would often come home. And so that was great because then he would watch the dailies with me and I would get a sense. I was starting to put together that sense of like, wow, this is what you do on set. And then this is how it comes out. And then this is what the director says when he sees it. And it was it was quite an education. Wow. So... You you come out and you're now taking on the role of sinking dailies on a flatbed, right? On yes. a steam back. Yes. This was shot in thirty five or sixteen. Was sixteen. It? Sixteen. So you were on like a steam back or a moviola yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Because I did I did the same thing in around the same era in the early in the mid eighties when I first got out of school. And so you were learning hands on from not having really done that right. prior, right? This is exciting that you're working with physical film materials. Yes, absolutely. And, and then with then from daily syncing, this would pass on to the editor of, of the project that you would be able to... The editor was Bill, but yes. Was Bill, yes. okay, okay, yes. so it was, so was the director, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. But you were able to witness that process as well and be part of that process after daily syncing, as you described. Yes, absolutely. No, it was a really... Real it was, education. It, it was great. And then my roommate at the time had... was the... Um, I think she was the production manager for Parting Glances. So we both worked on that movie. And then she used, you know, she kind of parlayed that into working on, um, you know, there were the handful of movies that were being shot in New York at that time. Laser Man was one of them. Mm -hmm. Monsters, which was that television series okay. that everybody worked on. Was that New Amsterdam Entertainment? Oh, God, I can't remember. Richard Rubenstein, I think. Maybe. Yeah, because I think he did some of that stuff early on before mm -hmm. he did Dawn of the Dead and all that other Could stuff. Could very well yeah. be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Magic Sticks was another one. There was a new line horror film called My Demon Lover that shot mostly in L.A. but did about six days in New York that were all stunts. So I worked on a lot of those kind of movies um, as, a, uh, as a production assistant, then as a second assistant director, um, eventually as a first assistant director and right around the time that I was really doing a lot of first ADing is the time when I you know when apparatus began wow that's so. exciting and and simultaneous to you uh Barry and, and Todd are doing what at that time you know for, I, for work and they're in New York right I think they're right. in New York right Todd was working uh as a preparator, I think, for the Paula Cooper Gallery. But he was also, you know, Bard College has this um, summer MFA program. Uh, and Todd spent the summer before we started Apparatus uh, at that MFA program. He never finished his MFA um, for reasons that will be obvious. Mm -hmm. But he did, um, he spent the summer making a movie called Superstar. Uh, the Karen Carpenter story. Karen Carpenter story, that's right. And, um, and right as we started Apparatus, he was finishing that film. Now, I had a little editing room experience, so I helped him uh, really just prepare for the sound mix because I had done that before. Right. And, uh, and Setting up the cue sheets and all that. Cue yeah. sheets and, and, and all, all the, the reels. Exa exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, and, and went to a lot of the mix with him really for my own edification. I mean, he didn't, it's not like he really needed me and to. This was the era when it was all old multi-dubber rock yes. and roll, 
like long before, because I remember mixing in those rooms. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, real analog style. Um, and the movie, you know, look, we we began working together at Apparatus, but the mo- the seeing Superstar and realizing that that movie was such a, um, I mean, it, it's a, an extraordinary film. But what my real epiphany was, this was a movie that was. Um, provocative, completely original, um, but also highly entertaining. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, the, now I kind of get what I want to do. And Todd started preparing uh, his next film. And at first he said, you know, and also, I mean, I'm, I'm skipping over. There was a, a tremendous amount of controversy around Superstar that um, – you know, made it uh, very well known and very, very successful until it was yanked from distribution. Um, but when Todd started preparing his next movie, he he was thinking he would do something. He'd done a 40-minute movie, and he thought maybe he would do an hour-long film. And I really, you know, I really convinced him to to think about it maybe as a feature film, which is probably the biggest contribution I made to Poison. But... Um, but then, you know, slowly over the next year or two, we started putting together the financing and the production. So he was originally thinking of it as more of a short or a short format, a, maybe a broadcast hour, uh, uh, I, a, I, not a full feature length, a 90 for a, minute. For a moment. Wow. For a moment. So. Yeah. So you helped him develop that, and then you re- you helped raise the money for that. I helped raise the money for that, and with Lauren Zelaznik, uh, who we had also gone to Brown with. And then, you know, raising, there was raising the money, but then also mounting, a you know, a real production on the means that we had, which was, you know, uh, I mean, we shot for four or five weeks. Um, we didn't stop and start. We did, you know. We, we went straight through. We went straight through. Right. Uh, and no, then, no, no union workers then, right? Or did you have well, to? Did you have to deal with the unions even back, back then? Back in the in that day, in those days, uh, there was a um, well. There were two unions for one thing. There was Nabit, which was considered uh, the more indie friendly n- union, right? Because the Nabit and IATSE were separate. They at that were completely point. separate. That's right. Okay. And and there was also a sort of tacit understanding that the little movies like ours were the training ground. So there wasn't the tension that there is now. I mean, it was cons- if you were under a certain budget level... It the, was teams, like, the Teamsters didn't lean, on you, mm-hmm, lean in on you back then. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't like there was no hostility. Now, I did work for... When I was in my second AD days, I did work for a, a, a production... A line producer who was famous for trying to be non-union on bigger productions. And the Teamsters shut the, the production down. Um, which, frankly, as well they should have. I mean, it was, you know, it was a, uh, y- y- there was no way he was going to get away with that. It was flagrant. It was flagrant. But uh, on our little movies, it was never an issue. Right, right. So uh, uh, let's go into uh, 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 all of the different departments and people you've worked with. I know everyone seems to, everyone will want to talk with you about the the directors that you've worked with, which there's a long list of, but also cinematographers like Ed Lockman and editors like Alfonso. Right. Uh, um, you've developed real linear relationships with these people, and they've now come back to repeat, because I think every producer has sort of an ensemble and departmentally, correct? Talk a little <clears throat> bit about that. I mean, they do, but, you know, it's always... Look, I would say two things I'm really proud of is... Uh, giving their first big breaks to Mary Salberti and Ellen Curris. Um, and, you know, Ellen, I had to practically, like, drag her onto set to shoot a feature, and obviously she's never looked back. No. Um, uh, but, um, but you know, you have to keep a sort of, you know, we're always looking for people to, uh, you know, to be in that pool, but also they, you know, people grow out of it, you know, and um, we work, we give a lot of people their first breaks, often their second and their third, and then they go off into the sunset, you know, on a much bigger budget. Right, and you and they don't stay part of the the internal 
uh, family that you've, you've I mean, also they still, raised. You yeah. know, they still, we still consider them that, but they often, it's just, I mean, there's, you know, Ed is a little different because he, um, he really will go from big to small in a way a lot of cinematographers just don't do anymore. Absolutely. And, and, with, and with Todd, he'll, he'll give his right arm every time. Pretty yeah, much, I right? mean, he's retired after every movie we've done. And then there he is back again. So, you know, uh, so I don't see him going anywhere. What a, what an artist. Yeah. What a, I mean, I just adore Ed and known him for many years. Um, I, I'm going to flip back in time because okay. there's a, there's a subject I'm, I'm really fascinated by. Um, your father, John, mm -hmm. uh, was a, a, a fairly substantial still photographer. I've seen some of the images. Right. And I've also seen some of the the history behind that because he worked in, at the same time as photographers like Gordon Parks, Walker Evans, Ben Sean. Well, they all worked at the they, Farm they, Security the, Administration. Exactly, they were all there, right, yeah. Right. And this was a, 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 a very sort of beautiful uh, a, a, a body of photojournalistic work. Mm -hmm. He passed away in 1975, but what was your life growing up in a home with a dad like that? And do you feel that that had any influence on your life today in, in, in film and what you do? Um, you know, he died when I was pretty young. He was, you were young, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, he, was, he was an old dad. He was 20 years older than my mother. Okay. So he was born in 1914. So uh, by the time uh, me and my, we, there, we had, I have older half siblings from his first family. And by the time my brother and I came along, um, he was, he had been a staff photographer at Look Magazine where he'd done a lot of extraordinary work, Look Folded, and like a lot of, you know, uh, photographers of his generation, he was struggling a bit. So, uh, um, so, you know, we kind of, our, our youth was, uh, we did go with him on some crazy trips. Uh, when he was a photographer for yeah. Look. Uh, no, after or Look, when after, he was freelance. When he was freelance, okay. Um, where, you know, for example, um, he was hired by MD Magazine to take a photograph of the tree that Hippocrates planted on the island of Kos. Because remember, in those days, if you wanted a photograph of something, somebody had to go take it. Right. You couldn't, that, it was you know, the, that was the way it was, right. Right. And, you know, the, of course, there were, you know, there were uh, libraries like Magnum, et cetera. But, um, but if you really wanted something specific, you had to put someone on an airplane and, and, um, and uh, you know, pay them to do it. So he managed to get he had that. He had a couple other uh, assignments throughout Europe. So he spent a summer. What he would do is take, you know, he would get uh, uh, first class accommodations, et cetera, but just for him. And then he would take that money and turn that into, you know, four coach airplane tickets. Or I think in those days we flew charters. Um, you know, that was oh, the yeah. super cheap way to oh, go. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then we would travel, you know, we would drive around and our hotels would get less and less and less nice um, till the end. But it was great. I mean, it was it was really fun. Adventure. I mean, the the real thing I remember, you know, uh, there was a there was a lot of importance placed on doing you know something artistic. My older sister is a you know, and again, she's substantially older than me. Is a very well known modern dancer. Uh, my other older sister uh, is a well-known experimental filmmaker. Oh, okay. um, And, you know, so there was a lot of emphasis in my family about doing something, you know, that felt, you know, artistic. My older brother, who unfortunately passed away, was a, was a wonderful writer. Uh, so, you know, it's, it was, that was, I would say, the biggest influence. Talk a little bit about your, your older sister's uh, work. Have you... In her life, yeah. You know, she uh, really showed me when I was, when I was she, and she was 12 years older than me, so not as, um, it didn't feel quite as... You were, we're not contemporary, right. Right, right. But, yeah. uh, 
but I remember, you know, she when I was when I was very small, uh, I went to the movies with her a lot. Often she'd tell my parents that, you know, she was taking me to see Oliver and we'd go to 2001 or, you know, um, or we were going to go see, uh, you know, Mary Poppins and somehow we'd end up at Alice's Restaurant. So Alice's Restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. So there was, you know, uh, she was a big influence on me in terms of like all the different ways stories could be told. Right. So so you were... You you had a a, a healthy movie going background. And, well, the other thing to remember, yeah. though, that I think is important is I did grow up in New York City, yeah. and let's talk about on that. the Upper West Side there were a lot of movie theaters. The Thalia, right? the Thalia. Right. Uh, more importantly for me, though, the Olympia, okay. which was a. Um, um, hang on a second, I can hear my phone buzzing. I'll turn it off in case that's, you guys are picking fine. it up. Um. um. Uh, But, sorry, I know we're having financing issues on the movie in Romania, but it can wait for another half hour. It can wait. (laughs) It can wait. These things happen. Yeah. Um, So you were talking about, now now, this is a part of your life that I'm very interested in. Right. You know, I I was born in Manhattan, same year as as yourself. yeah? Yeah. And I lived in New York until 1972, and then I moved to... Brussels, Belgium, where I grew up until I was uh, seventeen, wow. and I came back. But in those years, in the in the sixties and the seventies in New York, I was around. I had family here, and you were here in school. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, throughout because yes. your your family did not move from. We did New not York. move. No, okay, we stayed. I don't think we could have afforded to move. Well, to be that's honest. lovely though. You were here. So, I mean, and, what it meant was, you know, in the seventies, uh, it there was, you know. Very strangely, given given the fact that New York is crazy safe now, w- children don't have nearly as much freedom. And from the time we were eight or nine years old, we were pretty much going everywhere by ourselves. That's what I remember exactly. You know, on the trains and the buses, et cetera. And every Saturday or Sunday, we would go to the Olympia, which was a duplex that later got turned into turned into a you know quadruplex or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it was one of those theaters. It was a second-run movie theater, I which doesn't it. exist anymore. I love really, it. I love it. Calendar programming and the best. Um, and it was uh, well, no, it was. It would just take the movies. It would like after Poseidon Adventure had been in the it theater, would do, it would do the second run. That's of, right. a, of a film. That's right. So it was. It 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 occupied a space between what repertory calendar theaters That's were right. and new release theaters. That's right. And those theaters don't really exist they anymore. They really don't. It doesn't exist anymore. And the Olympia was, you know, your feet stuck to the floor. Ah! You could hear the other movie, you know, uh, as you were watching in your the other movie. Theater. You could yeah. hear the movie in the other theater. And they showed a lot of R-rated movies, and we would, when we were 9 or 10, would just wait for some Columbia student to, you know, uh, walk by and ask them to take us in so that we could see, for example, Patton. You know, or or Blazing Saddles, or whatever it was that you know we wanted to see. It was it was a dollar, and um, and if we liked the movie, we'd just stay and watch it again. Awesome, and you were able to see content that you were not allowed to see at your age by sneaking in and and doing right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think also at the time, because there wasn't such a culture as there is now, of like this is for children and this is not. You know, um, and there weren't that many movies, family movies or children's movies. So often what our parents, my parents would go see a film and then decide to take us to it. Right. Because there because it was a great era of filmmakers like John Cassavetes, Paul Mazursky. Right. People who were heroes for all of us who got in. To the industry right. when when you did and in the right. same years that right. I did as well. And then because yeah. my mother my mother was French. Yeah, and talk to me about that. Yeah, because well, I've never heard about her. Yeah, she uh, you know she was born in the southwest of France. She immigrated to America in her early twenties, and uh, when I was growing up, she went to see a lot of French movies. Which you know, let's remember in that time. When you said you were going to go see an art house film, you meant you were going to go see something see with farm. subtitles. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did, did, not to interrupt, no, but it's growing okay. up, did you, I, I don't know enough about, we don't know each other that well, 
Did you learn to speak French from your mom growing up as a child, or did you not pick up the language, or was it moderate for you at the time? Um, you know, there was a big, you know, I, I, for example, in the public school that I went to, there were many kids whose parents didn't had accents or sp- or or were the only English speakers in their family. It was very common. Got it. They were so, first generation right. from an immigrant family, right? Got which it. I was only ha- half. I mean, you know, uh, so. Um, so none of us wanted to speak the language our parents spoke. Right, right, right. So, so that was part of being independent. So our parent, you know, my mother would speak to me in French and I would answer in English. I certainly spent enough time in France to pick up, you know, French reasonably well. But, you know, my mother's been dead for almost 30 years, so right. I don't really have anybody to speak it to when I'm here. Right. I have a lot of family in France. Well, maybe not as much as I did. In the Southwest? No, in Paris now. In Paris now. And a lot of them don't speak much English, so I have to speak French when to them you're when there. I'm there. Yeah. And, and your father's background, although I know he was born in Minneapolis, I got in, yeah. in 1914. Where, 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 does, where, do they ha- where do the Vachons hail from? You mean uh, from, from a genealogical point of yeah, view? Yeah, yeah, immigrant. Is there, is there, not that that's uh, something that we all study, everyone has a different um, disposition about stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, mine is is lackluster at best. No, no, but no I, of course. But uh, Vachon is a very common French-Canadian name. Yeah. And when I go there, uh, you know, everyone's like, well, you must be related to the Vachon from Quebec. You know, you must be related, there's some Vachon, and I'm just like, nope. Nope, not as far as I know. Right. There's a famous cake maker that's like hostess. So people, whenever people go to Quebec or Montreal, they I always get tons of pictures of the delivery trucks with Vachon on it. Right. So your, your name is everywhere in Montreal. Right. So I Quebec guess City. it's just yeah. you know it's yeah. just like <laughs> somehow one of those one of them drifted down to Minnesota and that was that. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, you know, the 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 French territory right uh, uh, emanated from the fur trappers up exactly, in, up, in, exactly. Uh, up in the north, and they made their way that way through the Acadians down to New Orleans yep. and all that. So there's a history there. But yep, yeah. So um, uh, let's go back to uh, uh, to growing up uh, in New York. You talked about the movies. Where did you go to school? Where do you? What were your your years like in school growing up in the city and? And uh, where did you where did you inhabit during those years? I actually had I had the great good fortune to go to uh, the High School of Music and Art, okay. which is now known as LaGuardia. Uh, and I my senior year, they shot the movie Fame. Right, of course. They didn't uh, music and art and performing arts both had the same principal, but they were in separate buildings in different parts of town. The movie didn't shoot in either building; it shot in a abandoned high school. Uh, in in uh, Midtown, um, but they used students from both schools as extras, and and um, and in, and they used you know the the orchestra. They kind of combined both schools in the movie, and so when I see the film, it's not just about my high school. It's the faces are the same. Right. It's you know the kids I was in school with. In school with. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it really deals with that. Yeah. So, it's uh it's uh, but it was a great place to be in school. Yeah, and uh also uh a, a, an environment that would lead to interests that you have today, of course. Yeah, right? I I mean it was I I I think the, you know, also remember this was the bad old days uh the late 70s. Um New York was falling apart. Uh, our classes at LaGuardia routinely had, you know, over 35, sometimes 40 kids in them. There weren't enough seats. There often weren't enough textbooks. But it made me realize that all that really matters is peer group. And it was a bunch of students who were all very passionate about something. And um, it made for an extraordinary environment. So classmates from the, that era, uh, you go to Brown, you come back to New York. Any of them, any of that, any, yeah. of, any of that alumni still in your life today, prominently in your life today, or, or, or just in a social way? Um, I, pr- what do you mean by prominently? Prominently professionally or prominently socially? I mean, mostly socially, mm-hmm. but, you know, we come across each other, like Jean Sien, who's an extraordinary editor. We went to high school together. Wonderful. And uh, Lynn Nottage, who's an extraordinary playwright. We, she was two years behind me at, uh, um, at Music and Art. Uh, Julie Goldman, who's a documentary producer, 
Uh, I think she only did two years there, but she was there. Um, so there's a lot of people, you know, in my orbit. In who, your orbit yeah. that were from that era. Yeah. yeah. And now I, I've known uh, Pam Kofler mm-hmm. for as long as I've, I've known you, actually, ironically, because I, I have friends with, fairly good friends with Russell for uh-huh. having done what I had to do sure. in my life. Um, tell me a little bit about the foundation of you Pam, and also a woman that I used to know, but I don't know where she is these days, Katie Rumel. Is that, is Katie still? Katie has sort of, you know, kind of left the business to start a family, but uh, I think is, you know, thinking about coming back and we're certainly encouraging her to do so. Got it. And, but your, your foundation with Pam, how did that come together? She was not a fellow classmate of yours at at Brown. How did you and Pam come together to form the partnership to create Killer? Uh, I made a movie, um, I produced a movie uh, called Postcards from America. And um, towards the end of it, uh, we needed, a, you know, a post supervisor. Now, I had this experience on a couple of different movies where, you know, for example, Randy Poster, who's a very well-known music supervisor now, uh, when we were producing the film Kids, he came up to me and said, um, you know, uh, I, I could be your music supervisor. And I was like, great. What's a music supervisor? I love it. So, uh, and it was sort of the same thing on um, on Postcards from America is I was producing uh, the movie with um, uh, a man named Craig Paul. And he was like, you know, I really think we need a post supervisor. I was like, right. What, what are they again? Because ah! I'd never had one before. Uh, so we, I can't remember. I think we probably found Pam through Lauren Zelaznik. And she did postcards. Then we had this kind of amazing run. She was our line producer on Kids that Lauren and I did together. Uh, um, and then Lauren went to work for VH1. Um, and... Uh, uh, a couple more movies started coming through the over the transom. We did Stonewall. I shot Andy Warhol. So we had these three movies that Pam Line produced in a, really in the space of a year, very little downtime between them. And it kind of gave us the ability to plan a little bit and to start developing a little bit and to start like... You were making multiple films at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but close enough together that we like... We had a sense, it, it like we rented an office that we kept paying rent. You know, it just and started you could to keep, feel... You could keep rolling because exactly. typically a post uh, uh, stretch could be anywhere from 22 to 26 right. weeks. And if you roll a bunch of projects together, that turns into over a year time That's right. in one space, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yes, yeah, so that was happening. And as uh, it just, we started, you know, we developed a, a shorthand... At, towards the end of that period, uh, we developed a movie specifically for a fund that Good Machine had raised to do, you know, elevated horror films, which is still the holy grail. It's what everybody wants to do, and very few people get them right. And we pitched the idea of doing a horror film with Cindy Sherman. And they were very interested in it. They agreed to fund it. And it felt like n- instead of Pam line producing that, it was time for us to start producing together. So that was the first movie that we, pr- I mean, look, I consider those mov- the movies prior to that movies we produced together, but it was the first movie that we officially produced together. And when you guys produce together, mm-hmm. typically a line producer right. that, comes, that comes onto a job will break down the script, build the movie magic budget. And and uh, if there and, was movie magic, well, I mean, uh, well not, there was no movie magic, right. but build build the right. line item, the right. itemized budget. At that time, you and Pam were doing that together, or would you bring on a line or a UPM to support what you were doing while you were raising funds to come up with, or were you doing that work? I, I I'm always curious as to how the roles overlapped in I your don't, company. I don't really remember. I mean, I think that. Probably for the first couple movies, we, um, I mean, we always had some kind of line producer or UPM. That would help build those budgets. Right. Uh, At some point to do the actual work of development, casting. I mean, also in those days, 
it, it wasn't, I'm trying to think of the first movie, it might have been Safe, was the first movie where casting became um, a big deal, where the financing was dependent on the level of actress. Right. Because up until then, you know, there was sort of this assumption that if you made the movie for little enough and you, you know, and it was, and it got to go to Sundance, everyone would make their money back. And I, you know, probably sometimes that was true and sometimes it wasn't. Well, it was the story that had to be told to the investors, though, right? Right, but like, for example, I mean, a movie how like, did you do that as well? I've been keep going. Yeah, but we we did it by being successful. So that's you know that's really all you need. Right. And, but then the cat, you know. So anyway, all to say, we, um, I think both, you know, Pam and I can both eyeball a budget. But we can't really act as line producers in any way, real way, shape, or form now. Like we have a project we're doing right now where the line producer is on vacation, and it doesn't start the move. It doesn't won't start shooting until January. But we're fielding a lot of questions right now. It's and it's a fairly big budget that we just can't. You know, we just keep having to kick down the street until she comes back. Right. Right. So you still have anchored on your team for each project oh, yeah. uh, a line a line producer yeah. that 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 creates the shape of the budget and what you guys are always probably dealing with is that the size budget of the films are dependent on the marketplace and you constantly right. have to be thinking about that now if you've made a sale all in to a streaming company that gives you the numbers that you've requested right. then that's a fait accompli but if you have to have something that you're building with an anticipation of what the global sales will be that's another building block project right, right. when you're doing that with pam are you doing that by reaching out to the foreign salespeople that are your anchored groups that you work with or are you anticipating numbers or building numbers with your knowledge your industry knowledge no you have to have a foreign yeah. sales right. person of i course. mean but we just look every every project is different. We certainly have equity financiers that we enjoy working with. Um, not every project is right for every equity financier. Uh, we work a lot with the agency reps, you know. Um, well, still. the talent agency reps. Yeah. yeah, or or as they call them, the financing group or whatever whatever they're calling them these days, um, and. Uh, and with Synetic, with John Sloss's group as but well. But like with something like uh, Endeavor Content, something like that. Right. Is that an example of what you'd refer to as that or no? I mean, we work with, we haven't had anything, I, I think Endeavor Content is actually uh, financing. Right. We, right. Haven't, we haven't gone down that road yet, but we've certainly worked with people at, at you know, uh, WME who um, help us put together the financing for our pictures. Right. And, but in the... In the decision making process, there's there's a target for the sale, depending. I mean, upon we usually have honestly at this point, I can pretty much tell you if you say to me, I have this director, I have this story which is about X, Y, or Z, and I have this, you know, these actors, I can tell you what it, what you're going to have to make the movie for. That's you what know? I'm saying. That's so that, that's that, that, that's that, just like that's that's you your know. that's the. That's the veteran knowledge coming through for that. Right. right. And and I'm not always right, but if I'm wrong, I'm usually, I mean, you know, filmmakers, you know, usually we're like, all right, you say you want eight million to make it. At the moment, character-driven dramas are topping out at three to four, closer to three. And that's with experienced directors and, you know, uh, cast at a certain level. That's just the way it is right now. Uh, for something to do better than that, um, you know, get more money than that, not really do better because it's that's not really a relevant term in, in this, then maybe the story is something that feels super zeitgeisty. Um, maybe the filmmaker is somebody who has had uh, success in that particular genre. You know, horror movies are kind of a law unto themselves because the casting isn't as important right because um, it's the genre because it's the genre uh so that's a sort of separate thing but for character driven drama um i kind of know where it lives right and and so there's no there's not a lot of guesswork for you there i mean that's why so many 
directors who like that kind of material are now making it for streamers or for television because uh, there's way more opportunity to tell those stories. Right, because they're not thinking about the whole sales process in a global sense. Right, they, and the opening weekend. Their, right, right, they've got their budget. Right. So let's talk a little bit. I, now I want to kind of dig in. I want to go back to some of the collaborations, but I'm really interested in talking about the change uh, that went place from that went from your early years of dealing with the theatrical content when mm-hmm. there was still a home video business. Right. Then when the home video business switched and uh, slowly started to become replaced by what streaming would, would take over and subscriptions would take over. And then the idea that the, the theatrical business would, would sort of not evaporate but transform because mm-hmm. uh, there's a, a, a drive for projects to go day and date and to be right. not part of the, the sort of the social uh, theater-going public right. world anymore. Where do you feel like, what in, in this lineage, where we are today, what's next? I have no idea what's next, but I think the reason Killer has survived for so long is we're very open to change. And, um, you know, one of the discussions we have all the time when we decide to take something on is it used to be, you know, uh, is this theatrical or not? Now it's like, is it theatrical or not? And if it isn't, is it something, you know, is it uh, a a day and date movie? Or is it something that would go out only on a streamer? Uh, is it something that could be a limited series? It's a, is it something that could be an ongoing series? Like all of those discussions happen over every piece of material that we're attracted to. Right, because now you've you've got different uh, arteries to right, fill. Right, and diff- you know, uh, a filmmaker said to me the other day, I refuse to call it content, you know, because that just sounds so menial. And I don't know, I feel like we could claim that word, you know? In some ways, this, all this um, uh, delineation between film and television and then what kind of television, et cetera, it just feels, you know, oh, that's more cable and that's more broadcast. All of that's getting so blurry. It's just, it's just storytelling. Right. I think that the, the, the juggernaut really, though, ends up being the... I don't know if it's in the mind of the public and not in the industry, but that there is an uh, occupation of cinemas by, uh, you know, these huge, you know, one hundred million dollar plus right. uh, studio budget action, right? Pictures, and that the films that I would think that that you and I both enjoyed in, in the seventies and and sure. that were the films made for an adult audience that were in theaters are now not exclusively on Netflix and Amazon, but heading in that, that direction. Uh, yeah, with I'd, very say limited that's, I'd say that's true. Yeah. And then the next question is, does Amazon or Netflix or one of these new versions of that, because Disney's getting into that right, as sure. well, is there going to be a turnaround at some point where someone says, well, maybe we ought to stream into a social environment and have an option for people to come and see things in a bigger room. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... And how does the world change? I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah. I'm very focused on the here and now. Yeah. You know, I, I, we look for opportunity. Uh, we try. We, But we also, we know what we're good at. We know what we're not good at. Um, and uh, and we, um, we never draw lines in the sand over what we will or won't do in terms of where our, where our content will go, you know? Right. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about Quibi, for example, and we're, we haven't managed to sell anything to them yet, but I'm really interested to see what kind of work they're going to do. Talk a little bit about that. Well, what, I don't know what, that much about it. I mean, what you know about it? Uh, it's um, it's a, a new service that is seeking content specifically to, um, uh, I think, to put into ten to fifteen minute pieces uh, to watch on your phone. So, and a lot of interesting people are doing it. So, you know, that again to me, that's like 
that's a challenge. That would be, I would be, I'm excited at the idea of um, doing something for Quibi and figuring out the best way to make that system work for the story we want to tell. Right. And, and, and it involves engaging in, in, in short format storytelling, right. which is not something that's been part of the, 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 the years of what you guys have done. No, that's Killer. not, that's not completely true. I, I mean, mean our, ultra short. Yeah. We did. Oh, well, ultra short. I mean, we did, we did a television series based on this American life right. for Showtime in the, uh, you know, uh, quite some time ago. We did Todd Haynes's Mildred Pierce. We did. Uh, uh, we've done two seasons of This Close, a uh, half-hour dramedy for uh, Sundance Channel. Um, uh, we did Z for Amazon. So we're, you know, we're. We, You're in the broadcast we're business, in the there. streaming yeah. business. Yeah, we're in there. Now, at, at this point in your life, you have been. You know, in a in the mode of 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 being a a, a a prolific producer, have you wanted to venture in also into being a, a single handedly directing and commandeering your own film? See, I always hate that question because yeah. it makes it sound like like um, or you're in, doing this thing. Wouldn't you rather do the better thing? Not rather do. I was I that I actually look at it a completely other way. Is it is it something? that you have on your mind, not something that you no. want to do. No, no, because I'm, it's a little bit like, I've known loads of cinematographers, mm -hmm. right, who have spent their life as dedicated craftsmen as cinematographers. And then a few of them, my friend Hernan Antonio directs Power mm -hmm. Now, my friend Oliver Bokelberg, that I right. know from years ago, directed Scandal. These are guys that got opportunities to do something different than what they were doing on set. Right. So you're... A producer, anything is open to in your yeah, life, but, I, but it's not really what you're interested no, in doing in your life. No, right. it's not. It's not. That's a, that's that was why yeah. I was asking it. It was never uh, uh, in the idea of saying, "Oh, wouldn't you want to do that other thing?" It's you know. That, I just yeah. think uh, you, it, usually yeah. it is asked in the context of like, uh, why would anyone want to just be a producer? And I, I get it. I, I get it's a very misunderstood profession. Oh, it's it's, but, so, um, it's so huge in the in what but, it is. But you know, um, it's what I do, and I don't really want to do anything else. Yeah, and 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 uh, in a in a life's work in a body of work, you can have so many things happening at the same time and make such a huge in contribution on a daily basis with all of the projects that you're able to array within one year. I mean, no, no individual can do that many things at the same time. It's not possible. So going back to, uh, 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 to the, the first time that you and Todd worked together when you were making the first work, mm -hmm. what, was, what was that like back then for you working on the early work? And, uh, and, and, and how did his uh, development as a director uh, uh, happen over the years? As he, obviously, he's today, he's a, he's, a, he's a seasoned director. But back then, it was starting. You guys were... In New York and right, yeah. I'm I just mean, curious about you know, how that all began. Uh, Poison was, um, you know, I think it really holds up. I watched it not so long ago when I showed it to to a class, um, and you see a lot of the seeds of the kind of you know uh, director Todd has become. But I'd say probably what's really changed over the years is he's just become. Uh, a real master of his craft. I mean, he is, uh, you know, he is at the top of his game right now. So, you know, any uh, the stylistically, Poison is still audacious, and um, but there were limits, you know, budget limits, experience limits, etc. That you know, certainly you can certainly find if you look for them, um, but. The movie, as you know, look, when I go see a movie, I think you know in the first five minutes if you're in the hands of somebody who can really take you on this, you know, on this ride in a great way. And, um, and once you have, you know, ascertained that you are, you kind of trust the narrative in a way that 
you wouldn't otherwise. And that makes for a more pleasurable experience, in my experience. Uh, and I think Todd had that from the very beginning. Yeah, that from the very yeah. beginning. And But n- not to dig in on it, but where does his... Where does his foundation come from to get to that point? You know, is, is I mean, not that I mean, not that it matters, but I think it does matter to people that's, to hear about that. I guess that's more of a question for, for him. Time, yeah. uh, you know, he's he's very intellectual. Uh, you know, um, is very knowledgeable of film history yes. and really sees everything. I mean, one thing that always, you know. When I meet young people who insist, and I feel like I've spoken at every film school in America at this point, when I meet young people who insist they want to be filmmakers, I'm always astounded at how little they really know about film history. And I don't mean to sound like a, you know, an old crank. It's more like you really got to, like, you know, filmmaking is all about referencing everything that came before you. And, you know, it always made me laugh when people would come up to me at the end of Carol and say, I don't know if you know this, but that, 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 you know, device was in Brief Encounter. And it's like, yes, everybody knows that. That was the whole point, you know? Um, so that always astounds me. Right, that, that they think that somehow that you were oblivious to what you were uh, contributing right. to and that they think that they've just come up with something, right. some incredible uh, observation. right. right. Meanwhile, you guys have been studying the the history uh, and when Todd, of narrative filmmaking for years. When Todd makes a movie, he um, and this isn't so unusual. I think a lot of directors do this, but but he really digs into you know all the influences. You know, wants everybody to watch. You know, all these you know a certain set of films for whatever movie he's making. But he also creates these lookbooks for every scene way before we start shooting. Uh, f- where every scene he gives some sense of the of images that reflect what he's trying to do, uh, the palette of the scene. Yeah. Um, and then he gives these books to the department heads so that everybody's working from the same thing. So the DP and the costumer and uh, the production designer all have a sense of like, oh, you know, he's going, you know, it's for this kind of mood and this kind of color and... And so this should this is the what the clothes should look like, and this is how I should paint the wall, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I look at 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 Carol completely mesmerized with every aspect of the image. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I it was uh, uh, nominated for a, a, a Golden Frog at Cambrimage. Oh at, yeah, yeah, Ed, yeah, yeah. Ed Lockman is yeah. a huge yeah. fan of that festival, yes. and I was there, and and. I rem- and I was the first time I saw the film, and I and I remember seeing the images, looking through the windshield from the inside of the car, and the way that he created the dirtiness and the refraction mm-hmm. of the light and every detail. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. It's like it's mesmerizing the work that was done. And then if you go back to Far From Heaven, mm-hmm. which to me is like a visual achievement beyond achievements, because in my world the post world where I came from, when you see a cinematographer's craft do something that in the case of that film was photochemical, Mm -hmm. he finished something with such incredible rich colors and such detail and such exactness that when I when when people would ask me, well how was Far From Heaven finished? I says, well we answer printed. It was finished on film. Right. That's right. Uh, And I'm like and they're like, no, that's not possible. Right. It's too beautiful for that. Right. It must have been done digitally. Craft. Mm-hmm. And and working with a great artist as Todd has with with, Absolutely. with, with, with Eddie. And it's like, and, and it's all of these ingredients that you've put together over the years to continue doing that. And then now in your current era, I believe you're you're heavily still heavily involved over it. Is it at Stony Brook? Or you're, or you're, I run an MFA program run MFA. At, at SUNY Stony Brook. Tell me more about what's happening with that and how that fits into your life. You have such a busy life. Um, you know, I was uh, I do speak at a lot of film schools, and I have taught at the undergraduate level and the graduate level at a variety of institutions, including NYU, Columbia. Drexel in Pennsylvania, um, and 
but really going and speaking at all these schools, um, I realized that film schools are woefully behind the times in terms of giving their students any real, uh, you know, toolkit for the world they're going to go out into. And um, I, I, I think I, I can't remember what institution I was at, um, but I was ha talking to a bunch of seniors and one of them ran after me. Uh, they were all about to graduate. One of them ran after me, said, you're the first person who's actually told us what the business is like. We haven't, all we've learned here is, you know, stick to your guns and be true to yourself and et cetera. And he said, I'm $200,000 in debt. Like, do you think I have a shot? I was just like, I don't know. I don't know what to say, kid. I mean, it just, it, it just felt almost criminal. And um, I was. Oh, the the, the 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 film school. Uh, this film, the, the investment, you mean? Yes. Okay. And uh, I was approached a few years ago um, uh, by Bob Reeves and Magdalene Brandeis from Stony Brook, who who asked if I'd be interested in helping them put together a film MFA program. And what I was really attracted to was this idea of trying to do something that felt very. Um, that, that felt very of the moment, like really trying to bring the industry into the classroom and uh, give students some sense of how entrepreneurial they'd have to be, uh, the kind of original thinkers they'd have to be if they really wanted to be in the content creation business. Um, and I think, we're, I think we're in our fourth year. I'm not 100% sure. Okay, of, the, uh, of this program. Yes. Okay. I would have to, I would have to verify that. Um, uh, and so far, I think it's been very, very successful. In this program, in today's right. marketplace, there's so much. Oh, and it's also an affordable program. It's an affordable yes. program to go to. Oh, yes. wow. Okay, yes. that's so, exciting. Yeah, so it's not $50,000 a year. Which is uh, uh, remarkable. Right. I mean, I've, the, I have two kids, that one who I've already put through college right. at Bennington, and then I have another one at St. Lawrence. And... Uh, uh, oh my God is all I can say yeah. to all those yep. that wish to pay back their debt. Yeah, that's a, it's a huge thing. Um, in the uh, the the program, do do the students also get a chance to intern on set? Do you bring to some of them? Do I mean, uh, you know, when we depending on what we're doing, if it's in New York, like on Still Alice, quite a few of them were able to to come to set. Um, but we also, you know, we find them opportunities in myriad ways. We really do. And they they make films and it's, you know, it's a good community. And is there um, energy placed in what now is become, uh, I think, of growing interest for, for people who are creating content that need to use the tools? Mm -hmm. Instagram. Right. Vimeo, LinkedIn, whatever, all of the the social media tools to make sure that their digital presence grows individually. Yeah. What is your feeling about what that means? And then also things like the YouTube world and people having followers versus uh, the process. When you think about creation of 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 feature film and narrative film. I mean, not to state the obvious, but there was a barrier to make stuff at one time, and mm -hmm. that barrier has been broken. I mean, I I think that this, the emphasis on branding yourself, et cetera, is a little, I feel like it has to be organic. You know, there has to be um, an organic way to use uh, uh, social media in a way that feels like it is right for what your particular story is. In other words, um, I remember in the early days of uh, of AOL, for example, right? Um, and I remember chat rooms. And chat rooms were originally where people went, people with common interests went to talk about, you know, anything from pornography to the sneakers they liked the best. Then advertisers started infiltrating chat rooms uh, with the idea that they could, you know, get into that room and start influencing people to buy this product or that product. Influencing. Exactly. And people figured it out in five seconds. And um, 
and we were, you know, like, and that was it for chat rooms. Um, and I feel like it's kind of, you know, as each, you know, platform, people kind of run through it. Young people run through it, you know, the way nobody's on Facebook anymore unless mm -hmm. their grandparents showing off their, you know, uh, grandchildren's baby pictures. Um, you know, uh, and it's, I just think it, it all, it's good to be, it's good to be knowledgeable. And I don't like, you know, I, I always make fun of John Waters, who said to me at one point, I don't do face page. <laughs> and I was like, um, God bless John Waters. Well, exactly. Please. But God I was bless like, him. I was like, because <laughs> you don't have to. I don't do you know? face page. That's great. You yeah. don't have to. My, my friend used to call it facial book, which is right. really not a very nice <laughs> thing to say. Um, he said, I mean, are, you, are you on facial book? I'm like, well, I, I guess I have a profile. Oh, how nice. I'm not on it. But having some sense of it <laughs> is, is important. You know what I mean? I do think it's like you can't, you can't just, I mean, you can if you're John Waters and you can if you're Todd Haynes. Absolutely. You know, Todd Haynes does not have a social media presence whatsoever. You could be independent of but that. But it doesn't yeah. matter. He's like, you know, there's, if you do hashtag Todd Haynes on Instagram, you will come up with a gazillion images and people commenting and talking and he doesn't have to do anything. The world creates so, it around him. Exactly. It's, it's a... It's a hashtag fan enthusiasm. Right. Without him, he doesn't have to do any of the work. Exactly. But exactly. if you're starting out, understanding those platforms and what they can and can't do for you as a content creator is important. This whole notion of the, uh, you know, the pressure to create, uh, you know, to create a brand, just feels a little inauthentic. Well, one of the questions I was going to ask you, I think I can't remember if I saw the name Casey Neistat or something mm -hmm. Neistat. Is that someone that you worked with? We uh, we had the good fortune. God, I can't even remember how long ago this was. Uh, Casey and his brother Van were producing a television show, kind of on spec, uh, called the Neistat Brothers. That went to, ended up going to HBO. And but were they not YouTubers? I think Casey was a YouTuber. Well, he's. I think he still is. And I think with a huge following. Yes. Am I not correct? Yes. Okay. So. Take me down this road. Well, it just, you know, I I saw an early version of the show they were trying to do. I gave them some advice uh, and ended up making the sale, being the executive producer, one of the executive producers, and making the sale for them to HBO. Oh, I And got it's a it. great show. And now when you watch it, it feels, I mean, at the time, I think people just didn't know what to make of it. Now it feels like it could be, have been made today. Okay. Yeah, and it's at least 10 years old, if not older. Oh, wow. I think. You might, have, you might want to look it up I'll look and verify it up at some me. point, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, you, so you collided with that. Have you been, has there been uh, uh, an approach to uh, do sort of branded content or YouTube renegade cowboy content out of killer. There's none of that. But why why there's we... no reason for you to have any of that. No, happening. no. I mean, yeah. you know, we, yeah. um, it, you know, everyone's always looking, you know, people in television want to do movies. People in movies want to do film. People on YouTube want to do something, you know, that, you know, they want to go to, I remember meeting Ryan Higa at uh, Sundance and um, when he was, you know, at the height of his, you know, YouTube fame and, you know, he was like, oh, I'd love to bring something to the film festival here. And I was like, but you have millions of followers, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's his that's his world, you know, literally like the movie that does the you, you, you reach more people than almost any movie here ever will, you know, um, but I get it. I get like everybody wants this this stamp or that stamp or what have you. Right. But, but in, I guess maybe, maybe I should veer off on that topic a little bit because you guys have sort of uh, co-hosted some space with, with Moxie who are in the advertising side. Mm -hmm. Have you had any cross pollination with your crew of directors in the commercial world? And has o that only, been only with Todd, he's done, um, he's done three commercials. Got it. So he's done a little bit of work with uh, in that in that arena. Yeah, I mean, he's usually it's driven by something, uh, like the last two. One was a, um, and I'm going to get the 
brand name wrong and I shouldn't. Whatever is the cosmetic company that Emma Stone, uh, you know, is signed is signed up to, she requested him for a for you know a commercial and Ed shot it, and then we did one for Givenchy that Rooney Mara was the star of, uh, that we did in Paris. That was a lot of fun. So you know when the right one comes along, he'll do it. He'll do it exactly. Yeah. So right now you've got the the Dupont film in, in in post. What else is going on right now in terms of uh, of projects surrounding that? You said you had three or four different things that are current. Well, we have five in post. Five in post. Uh, we are working on a series for FX that I think is actually getting announced today. Um, a uh, nonfiction series about the history of gay and lesbian rights um, uh, called Pride. Uh, and that's, you know, in various stages of production. Wow. Um, uh, we have a series that I can't really talk about yet, which looks like it'll go in January, which will be, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, a long time coming and um, a big deal for us. Uh, we have the Romanian film, World to Come. It's not Romanian. It shoots, it in, shoots Romania. in Romania. Yeah. Um, that should, you know, unless the financing fell apart while I was here. That's in January. That's when you were talking no, about No, no, that'll that. be in um, in September. September you're going to yeah. go out there. Yeah, yeah. go there. So. Fantastic. Have you worked there before? Uh, not in Romania. We've worked in other parts of Eastern Europe. So. And uh, and what's that what's that process like for you in terms of you get your all your local crew there and you bring over your principals? You have a right? production services right. company that it just worth that you work through. Yes. Yeah. So fantastic. I mean, uh, uh, what uh, uh, an incredible uh, array of life and wonderful things. Um, I really appreciate you coming oh, here my today pleasure. to spend time with us and. Uh, and thank you, and I hope thank we have you, you back much. here again. Absolutely. Thank you, thank thank you, you. guys. Thanks.